You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Hello, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and our guest today on the show is Vince Shorb. In 2006, he founded the National Financial Educators Council, which is an organization dedicating to combating the financial illiteracy epidemic. So we're going to talk today about financial literacy in America. What can you be doing? How can we be training up our kids, our grandkids? Vince has led the National Financial Educators Council in the development of 2,500 financial literacy programs and more than 80 financial literacy assets. He's been featured in publications on USA Today, CNBC, Yahoo Finance, Forbes, and many others. Welcome to More Living, Vince. Jim, thanks for having me. It's great to have have you with us. I, I, I want to get into so many things, including your background. But before we get into all of this stuff that's so important, first describe to us what is financial literacy. You know, I think a lot of people, when they hear that phrase, we think people that are just smart about money. But tell us what financial literacy is. I guess the official term would be having content knowledge on various personal finance topics. However, in the industry and how we look at financial literacy, it's more broad. So we're looking at, hey, do they have that knowledge? Do their behaviors align with a plan that they set for themselves? Do they have the confidence to execute that plan? Do they have the systems and team members available to to support them toward that plan? So we look at a broader spectrum of that. And and just beyond money management and and, and so forth, we're looking at the income side as well. Are they able to bring money in, uh, manage that money properly to save and invest for the future? And, of course, there are the four fundamental pillars of of financial literacy. So it would be understanding debt, budgeting, saving money, and then, of course, investing. Definitely. I look at the psychology, income generation, uh, credit management, uh, account management as well uh, as important factors of somebody's overall financial health. Absolutely. Uh, I think your background in particular is very interesting as how you got here. Why don't we start with how you got started in the financial industry? Yeah, so it was really just my own experiences. I started investing young about my first piece of real estate at 19. Things were going well, bought a couple other rental properties, and I lacked the fundamental knowledge. I made some mistakes. I started investing with credit card uh, loans, basically taking out cash advances on my credit card to make investments, which didn't turn out so well. Hindsight, I, I know why. But uh, I made some mistakes. And, you know, the thing I missed most about the time when I was having early success is those people asking me, right? I enjoyed talking about and helping. I had a lot of friends, family members, and even my, uh, my parents extended their friends asking me, hey, how do I buy a home? What do I do? And I loved having those conversations, working out budgets with people. And uh, so that, that when I, I got hit with a, a few mistakes I made, it cost me many years having to dig back out of a hole. And I was really motivated to help other people avoid that. And I really you know, wish I would have learned more in high school about that. My parents were great teachers, but uh, I wish I would learn more about money in, in high school and so forth. And that really led me to financial services. I spent 15-ish years in that space uh, doing a variety of things. But my last uh, few years, my last handful of years, were in the mortgage sector. And I was able to look at a lot of people's finances. So you see people come in, they look professional, they look like they have their stuff together. I pull up their credit report, look at their assets, look at their housing ratios and so forth. I saw they were in bad uh, trouble. And so I really wanted to you know, change what I was doing and be proactive. So when we originally founded the National Financial Educators Council, I was focused on youth 
we expanded since over the last uh, 18-ish plus years and, and really serve all ages. But uh, that's what uh, that, that time in financial services really was the, the gas and the fire for me that really drove my passion for where it is today. Vince, how big is, uh, is financial, how big of a problem is financial illiteracy in America? Uh, if we look at the main problems people are experiencing, especially today with high inflation and, and higher interest rates, it, it's massive. I would say one of the biggest problems in facing this nation as a whole. If we look at stress, right, find, and American Psychological Association, uh, their uh, survey always varies, but it's always 70% plus, say, financial stress is one of their leading indicators of, of, uh, of, of problems. If we look at uh, people's emergency funds, right, we see the data out there. A lot of people don't have $1,000 to save for an emergency. Most people are behind on their retirement. Many people were at record levels for student loan and consumer debt. It's a major problem impacting the majority of people in this country, and little is being done. Yeah, and so much of it is core knowledge. Uh, of course, a lot, there's a lot of other things, too. But you mentioned the focus initially on the youth, and educating the next generation about finances is such a critical thing, but there's only, there are less than 20 states, to my knowledge, that require a personal finance class as a requirement for high school graduation. Now, Tennessee is one of those states Yes. You know, when when I was growing up, we didn't have that. So, uh, you, you know, talk about the importance of financial education in our even in our K through 12 systems. I think it's critical, and yeah, Tennessee is a state that requires they require a half a semester to graduate. And the biggest problem we see, even with the states that mandate financial literacy is that the amount of rigor and time and qualified teachers that are actually delivering that is far below what any other subject receives. So we look at, uh, we evaluated all the state standards out there, and our conclusion was every state fails. Um, most don't have enough rigor and time. I would say the majority don't have the rigor and time required. Imagine spending a, a time, let's say, uh, I took two years of Spanish, right, in, in my high school. And I can I know a, a little amount of Spanish now today, and that's two years dedicated toward that. You know, half the semester of financial literacy education is too little and often too it late. Is. It's, today, behaviors form so young because we have social media, we have advertisers, all targeting kids, really building up this next generation of consumers. And so, you know, in the perfect world for us, we would see financial literacy courses established in elementary school, uh, courses that engage the parents so parents are actively teaching their kids as well, continuing through high school where it's really focused on helping them make their early financial decisions. The thing that got me in trouble, how to move out on your own, you know, considering student loan debt, how to avoid credit mistakes and, and maintaining those things because one simple mistake can cost you five years of, of, of future goals five, 10, 20 years in the case of student loan debt. I've talked to people in their 50s that are still buried in student loan debt. Uh, so, you know, I think a, a little bit of prevention could go a long way. In addition, that subject is needed by 100% of the students in the classroom, or I look at many other subjects that are being taught are used by a very small fraction. Science, for example, chemistry, biology, are used by scientists, astrophysicists, et cetera. But that represents less than 10% of, of the actual workforce out there. So let's get something relevant in these schools so these kids are protected and have a secure future ahead of them. Yeah, because everybody's going to use foundational money knowledge, right? I mean, um, it just seems like it's such a disconnect. Um, I mean, you want things like biology and the sciences and the math and all those things are certainly very important, and all our kids need to be exposed to it and have a certain amount of knowledge. But we know that everybody, when they grow up and be an adult, are going to have to learn how to deal with money. Exactly. You know, I, like for me, I never use anything in chemistry. Some basic knowledge would be fine, but I don't need to know how to balance the periodic table of elements. I don't need to know what X plus Y squared minus this equals. I don't care. It never impacted my life at all. And there's things that impacted it on a very significant way that involved money. Um, and, and I think it's, again, a subject that benefits 100% of students, unless they're independently wealthy and so forth, but the, the vast majority it benefits, whereas uh, some other subjects may not have that 
deep impact on somebody's life. I don't know, Vince. I would say people that are independently wealthy growing up, they, they it's probably second or third or fourth generation money, so they probably need the financial education just as well as everybody else. If you look at the statistics of what happens as money's passed down gen- by generation, which, of course, I know you're aware of all that. You know, money's been a taboo topic for so many generations. It's like we don't talk about it. It's considered kind of, you know, we don't discuss it around the kitchen table. We don't discuss how much we earn, how much we we have saved. If So kids aren't hearing that kind of stuff, typically, in their household. How much do you think that's contributed to a lot of where we are with financial literacy? I think quite a large amount, you know, and you hit the nail on the head. It, it, it's not a, it's a taboo subject oftentimes. Um, you know, the only times I really hear about uh, people talking about money is when they're successful, like when their real estate portfolios increase or when they bought a home in the hot market, right? That's when people talk, but they don't talk about the average time, the grind that it requires to focus on personal finances. And I think if parents could get over that taboo and, and just feel more comfortable talking with their kids, having just general conversations, things real light, like why are they purchasing one can of soup over another? You know, if they're comparison shopping, why did they choose that? Or bringing them in to talk to their financial advisor so they're exposed to these professionals. Or what are they doing at the bank, right? These simple things uh, uh, can make it easy. In addition, we can make it very interactive and fun. Like if we're trying to reduce our electric bill one month, we could sit our kids down with the electric bill and say, hey, Here's our bill uh, this year, and, and look what we paid last year. Um, next month, if we can lower that by 10, 20 percent, let's go out and have a you know a pizza party or whatever the family likes to do together. And so we can make it interactive and fun. Parents don't have to sit at the table and, and just drill in lessons. Uh, the other thing I think is very important for parents to start doing is to get their kids chores so they're earning, so they're associating work with earning money and then they're contributing to household expenses as well as saving for the long and the short-term things that they want. It's a good habit to get into, and so a habit that will build as they're adults. We're visiting with Vince Shorb. He is the founder of the National Financial Educators Council, and we're talking about the problem of financial illiteracy in America. When we come back, we're going to get into some critical finance topics everyone, I think, needs to know about. We're going to talk about where we are as a society. How can we get better? So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Jim Brogan, and we're talking about financial literacy in America. It's a real issue. How can we teach our young people more about money? How can we teach ourselves more about money? Uh, The reality is even baby boomers approaching retirement, the data around the country on things like savings and debt is just not what you would want it to be. And that goes back to basic financial literacy, I think. Our guest is Vince Shorb. He is the founder of the National Financial Educators Council since 2006. So he has spent the better part of the last 20 years passionately pursuing financial literacy in America. Uh, Vince, let's talk about the personal savings rate in America. Um, you know, it's it, it, it went up after the pandemic in 2001 and 2002, uh, and then this year the savings rate is down, uh, and it's down from its historical averages. Uh, I think it's around 3 or 4%, if I remember correctly. You might have that exact statistics. Um, you know, just about anybody in our field knows it or would recommend saving a good bit more than that in a good financial plan, both for emergencies, for things in the short term, for things in the long term. Besides inflation, because it's on everybody's mind right now, what do you think some of the other reasons are that people tend to not save as much as they should be, especially coming off the last two years? Yeah, and I thought the last uh, two years, you know, the COVID era, I thought that would teach people, hey, we need to be more frugal and save because unexpected events can happen. 
I think there's a sense of relief out there where, hey, we're, we're living back at our normal stage. But I'm always uh, very cautious in, in trying to warn people and our coaches and educators out there are trying to warn people, hey, now's the time to start saving and, and really beefing up. I think it's a critical uh, uh, skill set to have. And when we look at somebody's financial health, one of the first things we look at is their ability to save on a regular, consistent basis. Uh, some of the problems to, to, to uh, your question exactly, I think when we're looking at uh, personal finance statements, it comes down to housing expenses often well above what they can afford. Car expense are well above what they can afford to have that savings rate. And again, I think it's just a, 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 you know, one of these things where people feel like they deserve what their peers have. And, and when their peers are overspending, they're overspending, right? Uh, so the, the keeping up with the Joneses is now a global phenomenon because you're seeing what people in, in, are doing, not only in your workplace, but elsewhere across the social media sphere. So I say one of the biggest uh, issues is, you know, overspending, especially on major expenses, housing and car, and also just those daily uh, expenses that uh, we, we maybe don't pay close enough attention to. Let's talk about, Vince, some of the critical finance topics I think you know everyone should know about it's, it's kind of interesting I spoke a few years ago at a conference down near Waco Texas and it was attended primarily by young professional families so these were people primarily in their 30s some into their early 40s and I had a 50 minute presentation about money and I kind of had carte blanche to talk about whatever I felt like I needed to talk about and I remember that what I remember about it, because it's a little bit of a different target group than what I normally am speaking to when I do speak, you know, when I speak. And I led right out of the gate with with what I consider rule number one in terms of wealth management. How do you create wealth? And the number one thing is you have to spend less money than you make, than you need. Than, or excuse me, you have to make more than you spend, or you have to spend less than you make. So, talk about budgeting, and the importance of being able to know how to even construct a budget. And then I'm also going to follow up. I'm, I know I'm giving you several questions here, but what is a good tool, or, or are some good tools for somebody to sit down and know? You mentioned housing costs are out of line for many people. They spend too much on their cars. How do they find? What are some good resources to show them where those things should be based on their earnings? Yeah, I, I like your rule one, and that you know I, I love it because it simplifies personal finance, right? I think people get caught up and they feel it's too complex, and then there's too many things going on. But the the reality is your rule is the basis of personal finance. Make more than you spend, and, and enough that you'll be able to save and, and so forth. Um, so I think that's a great first rule that people should focus on. And you know it comes down to when I look at people's finances, it comes down to either making more money or cutting the expenses, right? It's one of the two. Um, so I think it's a, if we could simplify it like you did at that presentation down in Waco, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. And it helps people just, you know, not feel so caught up with, oh, I'm, there's so many things I don't know. Hey, just focus on the things you can control and learn those other aspects later as you're, as you're growing and able to save. Um, as far as tools, I think one, one of the main tools that you asked about, I, I think, is having somebody trusted uh, that you can discuss that with, you know, and, and, and sit down and get some independent, uh, independent guidance. Uh, having some clarity on, on your budget is, is very helpful. Um, you know, money is a very emotional thing. It's not logical. Um, and if we can help them bring that to the logical thing, one of the things our coaches always tell uh, individuals is, Okay, this is your plan. Let's get it in writing and, and evaluate the pros and cons. What are the pros? What are the cons? How does this impact if you buy this car? How does it impact your longer term future? Um, you know, so there's no hard, uh, hard and fast rule. Everybody's different. And a good example, I go back to my mortgage years. You know, when we were back then, it was, hey, we looked at the housing ratio to qualify somebody for a home at 28%. That means 28% of their gross income could be used to cover their housing expense. And it didn't matter. Uh, most people had. are spending more than that now, aren't they? They are. And it's not based on family size. So, so if a person with 10 kids had a 28% housing ratio, that's going to be very tough. Where if it's a single person that, that is, is, is qualified, that's going to be much easier. So we can't even look at standard qualifying ratios in financial services. 
we need to independently assess our own budget and our own tools. I think having a good person in the corner is always a good uh, method to, to go off of. That's a good word there. Um, talk about the importance, and this is a great lesson for young people starting out. Uh, the first would be they can control their spending. If you get your arms around that right out of the gate when you first get your first job and controlling that spending to where you do are able to save is so fundamentally important. But talk about, Vince, the importance of starting early when it comes to savings and investing. Yeah, it's critical if we look at, you know, that, that being able to save early. And then this is a big problem with people investing late because they immediately get into debt. Credit cards, they haven't been exposed to it. You know, when I was in college, I got, I think my first credit card was about $8,000. I was a busboy and a waiter. I should not have an $8,000 credit limit, but I did. Um, and, uh, you know, so understanding to avoid debt to control the expenses, to really consider your, your your student loan debt as well. That's a big one that gets people behind, but you hit the nail on the head with, hey, the ability to control your expenses and that delayed gratification muscle. It just doesn't happen overnight. It's a muscle that people need to develop because when we're young, we're developing spending habits with our parents' money, right? If our parents are continually just giving us money at our whims, we're not developing that delayed gratification muscle, and we have to do it as adults. Otherwise, uh, we, we learn the hard way. Um, so I think if, if people look at it you know, from a, yes, there is some analytics, there's some logic, there's some uh, basic uh, you know, numbers we're trying to do, but also they have to understand it's largely behavioral. I think that's a good first step in making better decisions. And I'll, I'll just piggyback on when we talk about starting early, I want everybody to, to, to the, the power of compound earnings. And I'll talk about briefly the rule of 72 and how it relates to this. You know, the rule of 72 is, you know, if you have a pot of money, whatever the interest rate you is that you earn, then you divide it into 72. That's approximately how long it'll take your money to double. So if you have $1,000 and you make 7% a, a year, It'll double to 2,000 within eight years, seven into, or, or excuse me, within 10 years. Um, so what that means is if we break that down, many people don't start saving a lot of times because they go into debt early. They may not start saving until, let's say, they start saving at 35. And they work all the way through their career, and they work to 65 years old, and they retire with, let's say, a million dollars today. Well, what that Rule 72, if you think about the doubling every 9 to 10 years, if they had started 10 years earlier at 25 years old with the same math, they wouldn't have a million. They would actually have well over 2 million. Uh, yeah. So, it, it, you know, and the last double, you know, it, it doesn't look like much when you go from 1000 to $2,000, but when you go from 500000 to a million or a million to $2 million, so if you can start early, you can add one of those doublings on at the end, and that's where you can really create some financial independence, right? You're exactly right, and that's one of my first. When I'm teaching youth, I don't do as much now as my role as a CEO, but uh, when I go into high schools, that's one of the first lessons we cover. It gets them engaged. They're like, I can actually be a millionaire with saving $100 a month, um, and, and it kind of excites them. It gets them involved in that. Um, so I like that you pointed that out. Yeah, for the young listeners, compounding interest, I always tell the, the, the youth in the class, get on a compounding interest calculator, play around with the numbers, and see what happens. It gets exciting in those later years, as you mentioned. It does get exciting. We're visiting with Vince Shore. We're talking about financial literacy. When we come back, we'll have more, in including some good resources that we can give to our kids, our adult children, and even that we can use as we approach retirement. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living with Jim Rogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way as you listen to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. 
check us out. Uh, you can check out our website, broganfinancial.com, and we have a plethora of resources there. Um, you, we've got several guides you can download. You can you can check our blogs. They're they're listed by content, and you can also podcast all of our radio shows and radio content. That would be at broganfinancial.com. Uh, we're with you every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m., and again from 3 to 4 p.m. So if you've missed part of today's show and you want to recatch it or see any of our bank of shows, go to broganfinancial.com, click on classes, or you can pull up your favorite podcast app, whether it's Apple Podcast or Spotify or whatever. Today, we're talking about financial literacy. When you talk about living the best years of your life as we age, every year should get better and better and better. Hard to do that if we don't have some financial literacy and some security. That's what we're all searching for. We're privileged to have Vince Shorb with us. He's devoted most of the last 20 years to financial literacy. He founded the National Financial Educators Council in 2006, left the financial services industry in order to make a career and, and really serve his passion of helping people with understanding financial literacy. And before we get, I, I, I want to go back to the critical finance topics. One of the things I like to talk about, Vince, is the importance of understanding time horizon. You know, when we save or invest, when are we going to need that money? And could you just talk a little bit about that? I think it'd be great for our listeners to hear. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and I, I like that idea. And we call it life stages. So that's just different terminology for the same thing. But, hey, you know, there's events that we need to prepare for at different stages of our life. Um, things change. You know, early on, it might be a focus on getting a career, getting the skill sets to earn more, making sure you're not making mistakes, you know, lowering your expenses, getting your savings up. As we're getting later, we have to become more adept with understanding investing, finding the right advisors and team members, watching our taxes, and so forth. So that that that, that concept of of looking at the longer term horizon, you know, I think it needs to include not only, hey, when you want to retire, but also what major events are coming up. Are you going to have a kid? Are you going to have 10 kids? Are you going to, you know, take care of your, your mother and father in your house? Um, are you going to get married and spend 250 grand on a, on a wedding these days? Um, what are you going to do? Because each of those life events represents major expenses. And, 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 and I think a lot of people do a decent job of budgeting their monthly expenses. Um, a lot of people do not plan for those big expenses that come up. Consequently, they're taking on loans and debt to cover those, um, and it gets them uh, off their uh, stated plans. So, yeah, the, that time horizon, those life events, I think, are critical to, to uh, uh, you know pay attention to and plan for. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned weddings, and Vince, I've got two girls, and they're 23 and 18 years old, and we probably are going to have a wedding coming up here in the next couple of years, I think. And one of the things I've seen with some of my friends is 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 really interesting that that I think is an, you know people need to consider is when when one of their kids got their daughters got married, they had a budget and so they gave their child the budget and said this is the amount of money you have. One way or the other, we're going to spend this money. So you can either spend it all on the wedding, or you can spend less on the wedding. And you can have some of this money to get started, do a honeymoon, whatever. But this is your money to use however you want to use it. And I've, I've, like I say, I've known a few friends that have done that. And it's just been very interesting to see how the kids start to prioritize differently. Um, I, th I think, I don't know about you, I think some of that is it's when you're spending other people's money, it's just, it's just different when it's your own. I found it's a great lesson to put priorities on people. I definitely agree. I think that's a great lesson. I remember back in my college years, I was funding my own college, uh, and I, I knew the my friends that didn't have to pay for college themselves. Um, they were it, treating it like they didn't have to pay for college themselves. They could go an extra semester or two um, where I was like, I cannot fail this class. I need just give me a D so I can get out of it um, and, and, and continue with my credits. Um, so I think, yeah, when you're at the wedding, I think it's a great example. You know, wedding lasts for one day buying the first home for them could last a lifetime. So I think, yeah, that's when you give them that money and empower them to make the decisions. It's a lot easier than coming, hey, you know, now now, mom and dad, I want to have, you know, this, this cater and, and just piecing off that. I like your friend's idea there. Let's just talk about the current climate, Vince. Um, 
you know, we had the pandemic, everything shut down. We were in tremendous uncertainty. As you said, you would think we would have learned to, you know, stash up some money for a rainy day, an emergency fund, things like that. But then we had, coming out of that, we had tremendous government stimulus. Uh, we had a lot of easy money policy, a lot of cash that the Federal Reserve was putting into the economy. So we had a lot of cash that was flooding into the economy, both through the Federal Reserve and through federal stimulus through Washington. And then as we discussed earlier in the show, 21 and 22, savings rates really shot up. And I think part of that, too, is there was, you know, we, we, we were still not sure how to spend our money because we were still adjusting to this new world with the pandemic and learning all about that. But then we get into 2023, and over the last year and a half, two years, inflation has been uh, very, very high. Um, the economy has started to slow down. Now, unemployment has continued to remain pretty low, but people have started to spend some of that surplus money they've been saving, and now we have this low savings rate. Can you talk, in your opinion, how much has the last three or four years compounded the problem because of maybe these factors and maybe some that I left unsaid that you could discuss, but how much do you think is affected by that versus it's just at its foundation, it's just an issue where there's just very poor financial educa education in America? Yeah, great point. I think it's a, they work together, right? There's a very poor financial education, and, and they're not doing what they need to at these times. So, you know, besides what you mentioned about inflation, I mean, it's impacting people's credit card interest rates, right? People don't think about that. Um, it, it's impacting people's rent. It's impacting really anything that people need to do, new car purchase interest rates. So really any purchase they're making now is amplified quite a bit as far as the expenses and that, how it's impacting their budget. Um and I think, you know, hey, if, if we were, if humans were rational type people, you know, as humans, we always gravitate toward uh, pleasure and, and away from pain. And I think, I think a lot of, for people that I talk with, it's a, a release now. They're, they're feeling relaxed and they're just wanting to go back to normal life. But um, it's I kind think of it's a human critical. condition, isn't it? Human condition. And that's why I think shows like yours and, and any time that people can focus on this longer term through long term education and and getting inspired by listening to other people and, 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 and so forth and hearing about new investment ideas. I think that's always a good thing to, to motivate people to increase their savings. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about baby boomers. You know, according to census data from 2020, so it's a little dated, but more than two-fifths, more than 40% of baby boomers are nearing retirement and have no retirement savings. Why well, do you think this generation is in such bad shape when it comes to finances? Um, that is a very scary a number, and I can only imagine how they're feeling right now. Um, it must be a scary time for them. And I think a lot of it goes back to, you know, I, I look at my grandfather, right, World War II era, Depression era. He was very frugal. I learned a lot from him. Um, and I think he experienced true hardship. I think, you know, since the, the 50s, I mean, you know, there's been some high inflation periods and so forth, but there hasn't been that true hardship. And I think hardships define people. You know, when, 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 when people go through hard times, they become stronger, smarter, and they're overcoming that. When things are too easy, there's no, there, we, we lose that. Um, and I think we need to, you know, help this next generation start to understand that, hey, Things may not always be so rosy, and, and we need to prepare them uh, for that secure future, for not only for them, their family, but also to be contributing members of society. You know, that's interesting. One of the things you said there, well, I mean, in particular, struck me because, you know, I'm 54, so I've got two newly adult children, you know, 23 and 18. Mm -hmm. And we as parents, and I see this so much, you know, how did we get where we are today? We learned life's lessons, right? We, we kind of got there the hard way. We had to do it by experience. And we made mistakes along the way. You mentioned you made financial mistakes that took you years to come out of. Uh, but it, it, even in general life, we make mistakes and we learn hard lessons. And then as parents, when we're raising kids, it's like we want to protect our kids from making mistakes. Yeah. 
And, you know, I want, uh, and that's a hard balance because, like, I want my adult children to do the right things, but I have to also understand that they're going to make mistakes and they're going to learn from those, and some of that's what, what is what's going to create what they become 20, 30 years from now. Very true, but that, that has to be a hard balance for parents. You know, it's like, hey, you want your kids happy and healthy, um, and, and sometimes it's hard to see them unhappy and, and struggling, but just thinking in the back of the mind, hey, in 10, 20 years, this is going to define their character and who they are. It, it's a very tough balance. Yeah, and do they need an iPhone 15 at <laughs> 8 years old? I, I, you know, and, and believe me, I'm not pointing fingers because I was there too. I mean, it's really, really hard to balance. Um, what are? Let's talk about Generation X and then, of course, and then the Millennials and then the post-Millennials, Generation Z. What are the trends you see in younger people from Generation X? Let, let's start with the, the Millennials, which is Generation Y, and then the post-Millennials, Generation Z, in terms of how they save, how they feel about money, and how they view money. Well, I think the the younger generation, you know, when I, when I grew up, I'm 50 uh, myself. So when I grew up, you know, we had TV, radio ads, smoke signals, right, for advertising. Um, nowadays, they have, you know, highly sophisticated ads targeting kids, not only to make purchases, but to influence the parents. So advertisers are out there, you know, advertising kids very, very young. Um, before they can, bef- before they're age eight, they can't discern between commercial and non-commercial content. So their reality is skewed. And I think you know when you have ads following them around on phones and in these cross promotions with fast food places and at these you know the the stores where things are placed at their level, it, it really causes this, this, them to be consumers. And when parents, you know, a, a kid throws a fit or something because they want something, and when parents comply, now we're conditioning them, right? So we're conditioning uh, these negative influences for that uh, esteem and to impress their peers. So there's a lot of challenge with that generation, um, and I think a lot of it stemmed by advertisers, peer influencers. And even if we look at the most popular YouTube videos for kids and teens, they're called uh, unboxing videos for kids where kids are opening up the new things that they bought and for teens they call it hauling videos where they go shop and show their haul um so there's a lot of these type of influences that parents really need to be uh protective and ensure hey that we're protecting our kids from these outside influences they're able to make rational decisions as they mature to adulthood Uh, i have one last question as we visit with vince shorb and talk about financial literacy vince if if people are using, someone is using the internet or other online platforms to search for financial information, how can you tell if what you are seeing is good advice, or can you? Great question. You know, the beauty of today is that we have access to a lot of information. Uh, that's the beauty, right? The, the 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 challenge is, hey, what's real and what's not. One of the first things I, I look at is, hey. Why it, Why would they be sharing this, right? What are they selling? What are they offering? You know, so if I'm in debt, I'm looking up how to pay off debt. Is it a bankruptcy attorney that's convinced me, hey, did you go bankrupt? Is it a, a debt uh, consolidation company that's convinced me that? So, you know, if you understand the motivation to the education that they're providing, I think that's a good initial step. If you find somebody that's independent, they're not a uh, promoting any product line, uh, they're committed to just providing unbiased advice, that's a good thing. Also, there's so many people to choose from. It's listening to multiple people and seeing who you get a good feel from, doing your research, but everything today, with everything that's that's out there, you need to do research and verify as opposed to just trusting the information that's put across. I think all those points are great. I think looking at the motivation behind something and asking, are they selling something? Um, if not, are they completely independent? Do they have conflicts? I think all of those are great things. Vince, it's just been great having you on this morning. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on More Living. I appreciate it, Jim. How can people find out more about the National Financial Educators Council? Yeah, so anybody that's passionate about promoting financial education or if you want to host local financial education or coaching programs, we're at Financial Educators council.org or just connect with me vince shorb on linkedin i love talking with people and it's neat because people from all different uh, experiences and life stages and so forth have a passion for really getting financial literacy into their communities and i love meeting people like that so i thank you again joe 
That's great. Thank you, Vince, and thank you for your service and, and all the passion that you've pursued in, in a very worthwhile cause. When we come back, we're going to have our, our dollars and cents segment. What are some common mistakes made with a will? So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. Here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. What are some the most common mistakes made with a will when you draft your will? I get asked this a lot, and I would say the number one mistake that I see of course, is not having one. And this is much more prevalent issue than you would think. Um, even with young people today, I have many people even in their 40s that say, Jim, do I need an estate plan? My, my rule for that is if you own something and you love somebody, you need an estate plan. And the most basic part of an estate plan is having a will, which basically is deciding and saying in your instructions, who gets what, how do things happen when you pass away. Otherwise, if you're in Tennessee, the state of Tennessee would decide that based on some rules that they follow. So the first is be sure you have legal documents. Uh, Number two would be not updating those documents frequently enough. I like to say about every five years. Now, I'm not an attorney. I know some attorneys that say more frequently than that. I like to say five years, or if you have a major life event in your family tree, and that would be a marriage or or a divorce, or a birth or a death, then you need to get out your documents and look at them, and then see, hey, how have things changed? And then every five years, you really should be reaching out to your attorney and checking in and saying, hey, has anything changed that you need to be aware of? I mean, if you look at the last five years, We have had two SECURE Acts that have been passed that change how retirement accounts are distributed at death. And it changes how we would incorporate our other legal documents into our beneficiary planning for our retirement accounts. So if you haven't updated your legal documents since 2019 or earlier, you very likely need an update. So I think every four or five years, you need to be at least talking to your attorney Um, And then the other most common one I see is you don't have, you've named an executor, which would be the person that would administer all your wishes in your estate, and you don't have a fallback to that person. You know, maybe you're married and you named your spouse and you've got three kids and you didn't really want to pick one of them, so you just didn't name anybody. Dying without an executor is a big issue. And if the person you've named either is gone or cannot serve that role, you potentially have a pretty big issue. So those would be my three most common mistakes. Number one, be sure you have a will if you own something and love somebody. Number two, uh, be sure you're updating it frequently. And then number three, make sure you have contingencies if your executor cannot serve. This week we've discussed financial literacy because greater literacy provides for more wealth so you can live the best years of your life your way. Many thanks to Riley for engineering the show today. Many thanks to Jill for helping produce the show. Have a very, very blessed week. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.